can't find my glasses. I found them. Okay. Sorry. P2. So we're going to continue on with protein. And we'll draw two amino acids first. And what we're going to show with these two amino acids um, basically is the formation of peptide bonds. And so last time we talked about amino acids and their basic structure. And we said that amino acids have an amine group, an alpha carbon, hydrogen, an R group, and a carboxyl group. Okay, and this will be R1. And then we'll make another amino acid. And we said that the difference between amino acids is generally that they have different R groups. And so that's our second amino acid. It's R2, meaning it's just a different amino acid. To form a di or to form a dipeptide or a peptide bond, we're going to remove a water. And so basically when we're talking about the digestion of proteins, we're going to be adding water. It's a hydrolysis reaction, just like the reaction to break um, glucose molecules out of cellulose or starch. And so this would be the opposite. We're synthesizing the molecule. And so we're now going to form a dipeptide. And so this is a dipeptide. Peptide would be to proteins what maltose is to starch. And this right here is a peptide bond. And what we're interested in doing in the digestive process is breaking peptide bonds so we can absorb amino acids, dipeptides, and tripeptides. In the body, what we're interested in doing is synthesizing peptide bonds so we can make products like muscle, milk, meet our maintenance requirements. We can make enzymes, um, transporters, anything that basically does anything is a protein and requires those to work. So here we have dipeptides and a dipeptide contains two amino acids which is what we just drew, and one peptide bond. A tripeptide contains three amino acids and two peptide bonds. And then greater than or equal to 10 amino acids linked together equals a polypeptide. And so what we're most interested in doing is breaking um, peptide bonds to form dipeptides, tripeptides, and amino acids so we can digest them. We're going to introduce something today that's kind of odd. Um, does it fit? Yes, it fits. Okay, this is a train, um, a Lego train, and when we do it for real, we'll probably have a video where you can actually see me, which is somewhat odd. But we have this, and basically this represents an amino acid. And the train works really well because trains do things. They move certain things um, from place to place. And trains, there are different kinds of cars. You have like an engine, you have a caboose, you have, um, we don't really have cabooses in real life anymore, but um, engines, um, train cars that haul coal, grain, other cars, tanks, oil, all kinds of different things. And so this is an engine and something that all um, components of a train share is they all have wheels. So in the same way, um, we're going to say that 
the wheels basically represent the amine group and the carboxylic acid or the amine group. They represent the amine group on this amino acid and then what gets put on the amine group or the R group uh, represents what is the job. So you guys can look at this and without much imagination or question um, you can notice that um, this is an engine and its job is to move. It's different from the rest of the amino acids. Uh, I used to get in trouble because I only had boys driving um, but you can see that the little girl is driving this train. So everybody can feel good that I'm not stereotypical that all train engineers are men. So everybody good with that? Okay so this is an amino acid. We have another amino acid and this amino acid is not an engine right? You can see that it's the numbers one two and three and we can pretend it does something or that's its, a, its specific R group. And so right now we have two amino acids. We form a dipeptide bond and they are linked together. Okay. If we had three amino acids, we could link those together, and now we have a tripeptide. Okay, so this is really going to matter one day in the near future, but just kind of keep that in mind. So the wheels represent the amine group, okay, and each train car is an amino acid. So basically, what we said is we take amino acids, we link them together, and what we end up with is a protein. Okay, and a protein has structure. And if you're fortunate enough to take biochemistry, you get to learn a lot about protein structure. And protein structure, we have primary, secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. The primary structure is the sequence of amino acids. So what order are the amino acids joined in? That is the sequence of the amino acids. Okay, and enzymes, digestive enzymes in our body are going to hydrolyze the peptide bonds. As we digest a protein, okay? The other three levels of structure are a little different. Um, secondary is hydrogen bonding. Or electrostatic. Bonds. And hydrophobic. Interactions. So some amino acids are hydrophobic and they will kind of cluster up and form a little hydrophobic core that excludes water and so that's the hydrophobic interaction. Uh, we also have the tertiary which is again clustering. Of hydrophobic, hydrophobic amino acids. And then quaternary is the interaction of polypeptides with each other. I'm not really concerned that you know a lot about the secondary, tertiary, and quaternary structure. I really want you to know that primary is the sequence of amino acids. And what I want you to know about <coughs> secondary, tertiary, and quaternary is that these are disrupted by acid or HCl and that process is denaturation which we'll talk about in a while but what it's basically going to do is it is going to expose the peptide bonds so the enzymes can work or begin to digest them. So the acid is going to disrupt the higher levels of structure so the enzymes that your body produces digestive enzymes can work on the primary structure. Okay? So now we kind of have some structure. We need to talk about how we measure um, protein. And the most common measurement you're going to see is crude protein. And 
crude protein tells us the amount of nitrogen in a feed. Okay, it basically is just going to tell us how much nitrogen the feed contains. It does not. provide information <coughs> about protein quality and protein quality is the ability of a feed to provide absorbable amino acids okay so it does not provide us any information about protein quality it also doesn't provide any information which is kind of on the same line of protein quality on the proteins to meet amino acid I'm just trying to scratch it out requirements okay it doesn't tell us anything about those things it has nothing to do with the amount of lysine in it or methionine or any of the essential amino acids what it looks at, or what we've done, is we know that feed protein, on average, is 16% nitrogen. And so what we do is we go in and we measure the percent nitrogen using Keldahl which is a lab methodology developed by the Germans. That's K-J-E-L-D-A-H-L. -E so we can use Keldahl, or we can use Dumas combustion, or Dumas combustion. And so uh, most of you will never see Keldahl. It's relatively dangerous. You have to boil acid and you digest the feed sample for a long time in boiling acid and then you add base and then basically from that you then um, distill off the ammonia and then you can titrate it and figure out how much nitrogen was in your feed stuff. Dumas combustion is more black box and that basically you combust the sample or burn the sample and it um, releases the nitrogen and then there's sensors in there that measure the amount of nitrogen released. Okay, after we've done either a Keldahl or a Dumas combustion, we know the percent nitrogen, and we multiply that percent nitrogen by 6.25 to give us the percent crude protein. If you're wondering where the 6.25 came from, the 6.25 is the inverse of 16%. So 1 divided by 16 um, should give you 6.25. Okay, good deal. And so to use as an example, um, to create an example, we'll look at the molecule urea. And this is the urea molecule. Okay, my favorite molecule. If I was gonna get a tattoo of a molecule, it would be urea. Okay, but I don't have a tattoo. So, I don't have urea molecule. I wanted to dress up Catherine as a urea molecule one year for Halloween, but Aaron said no. So, anyway, if you look at the urea molecule, it contains no amino acids.
also thought it cool to put Catherine in a cannulated seer's stomach and have her head sticking out. But Aaron said no to that as well when she was a baby. So, contains no amino acids. Thus, it is 0% true protein. And so true protein is different than crude protein. True protein is a measure of how much actual protein is in a feedstuff. But what we want to know is what is its percent crude protein. And so to do that, what we do is we write down all of the elements that are in it. And so we have a carbon, an oxygen, a nitrogen, and a hydrogen. And we see that there's one carbon, one oxygen, two nitrogens, and four hydrogens. We need to know how much they weigh, the weight of each. So carbon weighs 12, oxygen 16, uh, nitrogen 14, and hydrogen weighs 1. We do the multiplication. And we see that our molecule of urea has a molecular weight of 60. 28 of those would be nitrogen, so 28, because we said we're trying to figure out the percent nitrogen, so 28 divided by 60 equals 46.667% nitrogen. And what I wanted to know is the percent crude protein, so I take the 46.667 and I multiply it by 6.25. And that tells me the percent crude protein of urea is 291% crude protein. So urea seems like a great source of protein if you look at the crude protein value, but its ability to provide amino acids to the animal is essentially zero. It is zero because there are no amino acids. Now, we're going to talk about urea and why we feed it to cattle later, but because the cattle can synthesize their own amino acids, or the microbes in the rumen can synthesize their own essential amino acids and their own amino acids. We can really utilize urea in ruminant nutrition, but we can't utilize urea in non-ruminant nutrition. If you look at figure 5.5 um, in the textbook, it's taking urea, adding water, adding the enzyme urease, which is of microbial origin, and you end up with two ammonias and CO2. We're going to use that ammonia to synthesize microbial protein. Okay, I'm going to pause and make stop. I'm going to try and keep the videos at 20 minutes, but we'll see if I can do that.